Before the seizure started, Michael was a typically developing child. He was meeting every milestone and in fact was exceeding many milestones. After the seizure started, we started to notice that he was losing skills. And now, eight years later, he continues to be at the cognitive level of a two-year-old. We didn't know anything about epilepsy when this started. The impression that, that everyone has is that, well, you have a few seizures, you grow out of it, it doesn't cause brain damage, it's not that big of a deal. And for us, that was really not the case. It's very sad when we look at pictures of him as a baby and you think about the potential that he had and all of it has been taken away. My life changed when I was 17. I had just graduated from my high school and gone away to college. And when I came into the dining room one day, I fell down the steps. We went around to lots of doctors in Chicago, and they all said it was epilepsy. I felt for my children ever since they were born, because they don't know a mother who doesn't have seizures. She'd be talking, and then suddenly she'd, you know, the throat guttural cry, and then she'd cramp up, and then she'd fall out which is pretty terrifying when you're a kid. I think your parents are gonna die. So I spent most of my young childhood thinking my mother was gonna die. Without a doubt, I'm, I'm her caregiver. I've been her caregiver since I was 11. It all began one day he had a very small seizure. We went to the doctor, didn't think it was anything. And then those kept on coming back with greater frequencies and they couldn't control him. And you could see Jordan deteriorate cognitively. It's um, been very tough to handle. It is so terrible, like, um, I had seizures in my sleep, um, I broke two teeth in half, um, I've had surgery, lots of surgery done on me. There's been a lot of permanent damage. He's 15 and he's more like a seven-year-old. He still plays with Legos and watches cartoons, and it's hard for Matt and Nikki. In the middle of the night, like, I would wake up because I could hear him from his bed seizing, and I would scream for my parents. I would, like, just worry about not getting there on time. I remember my parents going in and out of the hospitals. I mean, they would switch off. Like, one night my dad would stay with my brother, and the other night my mom would sleep with my brother. It's hard to put into words the way you live life when a child is seizing. You're walking on eggshells. Every time when you're not home, the phone rings. You think it's the worst case scenario. When Stacy has a seizure, she could just have like a bad 15 minutes where, and then she can get out of it. She can also have a seizure where it lasts several minutes and then she needs to like sleep for four hours, five hours. She used to have seizures that required us to take her to the emergency room. She has those, but not as often, but we always are wondering, like, is this the day where we also have to take her to the emergency room to get her seizures to stop? I spend so much time worrying about what's gonna happen to Stacy when she's 10, what's gonna happen to Stacy when she's 15, where is she gonna live when she's 21? It's this whole unpredictability that's the hardest, hardest thing. The morning after my son was born, I had a stroke. That required an emergency brain surgery, and all of that combined developed into epilepsy. Some days it's 40, 50, 60 seizures, until finally, after years of living like that, I told my doctors, I have to cut back on the medication. It's not working anyway. And slowly I cut back, and I continued to have seizures, but I could finally hear my son when he called out, Mommy, in the middle of the night. And now, eight years later, doctors are talking about more brain surgeries. And I'm scared. Sam was diagnosed about two and a half years ago with the infantile spasms. And so for two and a half years, he's been having ongoing seizures. They're damaging his brain. 
They're also damaging his little body. I think any mother would love to hear their child say mommy, would love to hear, have their child have the strength to wrap their arms around them. I haven't experienced that yet, and, and that makes me angry because it's epilepsy that has, that has done that. I'm nine months pregnant right now, and the decision for Paul and I to have another baby was a very difficult one. We obviously have a high risk there just based on Sam's um, medical history. I mean, this, this baby's up against some tough odds. We're very frightened. We're very frightened. Julie was first diagnosed with seizures at age three. Eventually, she was quite well controlled until she hit puberty, and that's when um, we started really the downward spiral, which led to her first surgery, the temporal lobectomy. And um, after that, she achieved seizure control for about six months. You know, then she started the cycle again, eventually leading to a hemispherectomy, and she lost the use of the right side of her body from the surgery. Now she does have um, seizure activity in front of where they did the surgery and behind where they did the surgery. It's your worst nightmare. Asking a parent to decide, will you put your child through the surgery and maybe they won't have seizures, but you're gonna take away their right arm. My greatest hope is for a cure for epilepsy, for myself and for everyone. Well, if there were a cure, then she could be normal again and do a lot more things like other moms could do. It's important that we find a cure so people don't have to live like this and people can live a much more normal life. We're parents and we want answers and we're working together to try to raise the funds to find those answers. What cure gives us the hope for is that there's the possibility of finding the actual root cause of this. And maybe it happens in the time that'll, that'll be helpful for Michael, but at least it'll, it'll stop it from another generation.